All right, so now we're almost back on time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to Managing Chaos, merging 120 sites into a single clone multi-site. Um, probably the longest title to any uh, talk I've ever given. Uh, and, and it may be a slightly shorter talk, so I don't know if that's indicative of the title or not. Um, uh, but a little bit about who I am. Um, uh, my name is Clayton Parker. I'm the Director of Engineering at Six Feet Up. Um, I've been doing Plone work since about 2003, um, so a long time Plone veteran. Um, and if you're looking for me on Twitter or the, the internets in general, uh, you can find me usually under Claytron. There are some imposters out there, um, but make sure you, you have the genu genuine article uh, instead of those crazy imposters. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, we uh, did a project um, uh, recently uh, where we merged a lot of sites into to one site. Uh, so we're going to learn about the, the multi-site solution we used, um, learn a bit about uh, how to consolidate all the sites into one, and talk a little bit about how that Im uh, improved performance for this uh, particular case. Um, so the reason we got to this place, uh, we were doing a discovery uh, for a client, and one of the issues they had was uh, uh, performance. Uh, so they had a one single uh, ZOAP instance with 120 plone sites inside of it. Um, so has anyone in here ever seen that many plone sites in one instance? <laughs> of course, it's Brandon <laughs> in the back. Uh, so, um, and how do you like that? How did you like that? Okay, that's, and we were just talking about that. It was interesting. Uh, yeah, right. Um, so, uh, so the gentleman in the back, the gentleman again, um, he, uh, he, he has actually used that and had some uh, success with it. In this case, uh, the content um, didn't really make sense to be in 120 uh, different sites. Um, so, you know, if we look at it from a high level, uh, we have 120. Uh, standalone uh, courses. So in this case, the, each, each site is a course in an e-learning system. Um, so this, this image sort of uh, illustrates the, the disconnectedness of all these different sites uh, running within this one uh, poor uh, Plone instance, or Zope instance, rather. Um, so one of the issues was, was how they were uh, creating uh, each of these sites. So the site creation workflow uh, was a lot of manual steps. Uh, so there was no uh, policy package for each site. There was no uh, standard way of installing a site from the command line or from you know, portal setup or any place. Uh, there was a lot of manual work involved. Um, and it also involved using the ZMI. Um, so, and and uh, as we'll see, a little bit of uh, copy and paste. So, in the old way of doing things, uh, here's, their, here's their futuristic looking uh, CMS here. Um, you can see the, the new course creation button labeled uh, copy. Um, so they have this, this, this is just a, uh, a subset of, of all the sites inside of this one instance. Uh, so they have this one called course template. Um, when we were, started looking through it, we're like, oh, what's, what's course template? Um, then we come to realize that's that is how they create a new site. Uh, they walk up to course template, check the box, hit copy, um, probably wait a little bit. Um, and then, you know, of course, they have to click paste. Um, so this is the, the second half of the, uh, the new, new course button. Then uh, a lot of manual updates uh, from there. So, you know, the course template is just a plone site inside of the Zope instance, so there's nothing dynamic about copying and pasting it into a, a new site. Um, so once they've successfully copy and pasted the site, they go in, uh, well, first they have to rename the, uh, the Plone object, uh, lest they get the, uh, the, the content warning saying copy of course template. Uh, doesn't make a very, uh, doesn't make a very sexy course name, I don't think. Um, then uh, there's, there's a lot of placeholder content within each of these sites. So uh, once, once they've renamed the Plone object, they go into the Plone site, uh, start changing uh, uh, different uh, properties, uh, you know, titles, title of the site. Uh, there was, f 
for each course, there was an author, a course number, um, and some other properties as well uh, at the root of the site. So the properties were actually on the portal uh, itself. Um, and then uh, the, the dreaded catalog clear and rebuild. So since they've just copy and pasted a plone site, uh, the catalog is sort of in disarray because it thinks that everything is at course template slash uh, whatever for the path. So the plone site at this point is, is probably very confused as to what just happened to it. Um, so uh, once they've done the uh, sort of brutal copy and pasting of the plone site, uh, they can go in and do a clear and rebuild of the catalog. That'll go in and sort of fix up all the paths and, and get all the uh, metadata back in place. So at this point, um, we think we, we have success, we're, you know, did we have a successful uh, course creation? Well, we were able to create a course through the ZMI, um, but you know, one of the first problems we see is that you need ZMI access to do that. Um, so in, in this case, um, the, the administrator is, is comfortable with that and used to that, um, but that's, that's not a, a great place to be managing content, uh, especially well, inside of Plum. Um, because basically we're here, we're managing content inside of the ZMI instead. Um, and so another, another issue with this process is it's very manual. Um, you know, there, there is one person who knows how to do it um, and, can, and can go in there and do that all day. Um, but if they're sick and you need to uh, pull up a new course, then uh, you're probably going to call up your sick coworker and say, hey, uh, so what do I need to do exactly to get this uh, course up and running? Um, so there, there's the, the sort of issue of uh, the process itself, um, but there's also an issue uh, of you know, potential errors. So there's nothing automated about the process. You know, copy and pasting the Plone site, um, it appears um, you could forget to change a uh, title or change an author or change, change one a little bit, and um, you, know, you may go live with a, with a course that has incorrect information. So, that's not necessarily a, a great thing to happen. Um, another issue is that the, the way we're, they were maintaining the uh, course template was just maintaining that Plone site, um, which sort of had its, its pros and cons. Um, so if they wanted to make uh, sweeping changes to all the content, they could just go and reorder everything and then uh, you know, copy and paste that new version of it. Um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of downsides to that as well. Um, any existing course um, has to be going, you have to go to that course to actually uh, change things. So where the you know, time is maybe saved by uh, sort of managing a Plone site uh, that is the, the template, uh, you save a little bit of time, but there's, there's a lot more issues that can come up later uh, when we want to uh, uh, change things. Um, and, and if you have any questions, uh, or any comments, uh, feel free to interject. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth into how we um, did the, you know, the actual migration. I think this will be actually the first talk I've ever given that there's going to be no code samples. So if you're here for that, I'm sorry. Um, there won't be any of those. So, so on the point of the, the performance, um, one issue that we're seeing was uh, periodically the, the site would just uh, come to a crawl. Um, and so, you know, one of the issues was actually uh, HAProxy. Uh, HAProxy was doing a health check against the root of the Zope instance, and that was bringing all the Plone sites inside of that instance to life. Um, so it was loading all these Plone sites into memory um, and then, you know, bumping the other ones out as it hit the limits. And so this was causing a lot of havoc um, on, on the site. So something that was supposed to help uh, distribute load across uh, several instances was actually pretty much decimating them each time it was uh, checking to see if the, the site was up. So that's something we had to turn off uh, at some point just so that the, the site wouldn't fall over. Um, but another issue with this with the setup is that we have uh, 120 plus versions of everything. So we have 120 different catalogs. We have 120 different quick installer tools. We have 120 you know, whatever tools in the system, whatever the sort of base level Plone install is, we have 120 versions of that. Um, so that's, you know, that's a lot of objects. So I mean, uh, just the catalog alone, uh, indexes, um, uh, you know, just any, any object that's sort of the base of Plone is spread out across all these, these instances. 
So this, this starts to add up uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so that was one, one reason uh, we started to look at it and realized that you know, this, with the performance issues they're having, uh, it might make sense to, uh, to look at uh, other options. So one of the things they came to us for was actually to upgrade uh, these, these courses. Um, and so as we were looking at it, um, we, we decided that the best thing to do would be to uh, migrate this, this whole site into or all these 120 sites, 120 plus sites, into one site. Um, and we had quite a few conversations about um, if that was, was actually the right uh, way to go. Um, because we could be causing other performance issues uh, filling up one clone site with all these uh, courses. Um, but you know, after all the conversations, we decided that that was the right path. Um, so the first step to get to there was to get all the content um, into, into one uh, clone site. So in this case, all the sites were pretty similar um, because they, you know, they were being copy-pasted, so they all pretty much had the same set of add-ons uh, using the same skin. Um, so that part of that side of the migration was not that difficult. Um, I don't know how many, how many people in here have actually done a plone migration. A fair amount. Um, and, and most of you still have hair. That's good. Um, so, you know, migrations are not easy. Um, and, and as we saw in uh, Nathan's talk, uh, we saw the dreaded uh, instance, list of instance eggs. Uh, if you see that and, and someone wants to migrate, you're like, whoa, this might take a while. Um, so in this case, so that, that part was not a problem. Um, but migrations in general are still uh, difficult. Um, you know, no matter what you do, how much you plan, you always run into something that's, that's gonna, gonna trip you up. So we decided to um, take the route um, of transmogrifier. Um, so how many people in here have actually used transmogrifier? So a lot, a lot smaller subset of the people who have done migrations. Um, uh, and the, of those who have used transmogrifier, would you use it again? Uh, I got a half, yeah. Would you use it again? So that was, that was a pretty positive uh, review. Um, and I, I like it a lot. Um, it makes things, um, for me, it makes things a lot uh, easier to debug and to, um, to sort of visualize how the, the migration process is going to happen. Um, you know, sometimes you, if before transmogrifier uh, upgrades would be this, you know, either a giant script or a, a giant set of scripts that um, were sort of difficult to use um, and, and always made from scratch. So transmogrifier gives us a way to sort of use some of the, um, some of the, the things that other people have done in the past to do migrations and, and comes built in with um, things that help as well, like um, you know, dreaded Unicode uh, decode errors, things like that um, can be made easier with, with transmogrifier. Um, so the first step to get all the content out, so we had 120 sites, um, was we wrote a script, so even though we're using transmogrifier, we did write a script uh, to export the content, but that basically just executed a, um, a transmogrifier pipeline on each site and dumped out the content uh, to the file system. So for each, um, uh, for each plone site, it would run, I, I believe we used the uh, Quinter Group transmogrifier uh, add-on to actually dump out the, the data. So this, this gives you a uh, copy of the data with um, uh, all in XML. So it has all the, the settings uh, from the site. Um, you know, you get the, the uh, workflow transitions, you get the blast modified dates, you get all that information um, after you dump it out. And then when you bring it back in, you get this, the same data. So um, this helps because we had some uh, custom uh, permissions on things, and some other things we wanted to keep, um, like the uh, the author and the the course number and those things. So we got that all out of the the, the previous site and down onto the file system. Um, and once we had all that, then we can actually start uh, bringing it back into a new version of Plone. Um, and I actually don't recall what the version of Plone they were on. Um, 
but we were, we were going into uh, Plone 4.3. So we, we had all the, the new toys to work with there. So uh, because we wanted to use Lineage, uh, we also wanted to use Dexterity. Uh, so we created a uh, set of custom uh, Dexterity types, um, one for uh, department and one for uh, the actual course. Um, so, oh, and, and the other thing, um, so I mentioned there were some add-ons, uh, so we had to do a little bit of work uh, porting, you know, a theme um, and a couple other add-ons uh, to Plone 4, but that, that part wasn't too, uh, too difficult. Um, so, so once we migrated all the, the content into the new uh, system, um, here's, here's more what it looked like. So before we had this, you know, listing, scattering of, of Plone sites, now we have uh, all our Plone sites uh, separated into 30 different departments. Um, so now when you walk into the, into the Plone site, uh, you, have, you have 30 folders uh, that are departments. Uh, you go into a, a, one of those folders and you see all the uh, courses for that particular department. Um, so this made things easier uh, right off the bat because we, we can actually find exactly where, uh, we, we sort of know where a course uh, might end up based on what department it is. Um, so there, was, there were a few tricky things about this because before um, everything just had a you know, single ID, um, but that ID actually had the information of the department and the course number in it. Um, so in our pipeline to bring things back into uh, Plone, we were able to use that information to create the department folders if they didn't exist and then create the uh, course objects uh, inside of there. Um, we were also able to take the um, properties from the uh, original site uh, that were on the site route uh, and change those into something we could use to um, add those properties onto the, the centers, or not centers, the uh, uh, courses themselves. Um, so this is a much cleaner looking uh, architecture. Um, so as we can see, you know, coming from uh, a crazy scattering of sites to something that's more uh, more structured in, in a way that makes sense. Um, this also gives us a way to uh, potentially give uh, someone access to one uh, department's courses very easily. Uh, whereas before, if you know, he had, say you had 30 departments and you wanted to give uh, Joe access to it, you had to go to each uh, department and give them access there. Um, here we could use the, the built-in system to do that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. Um, so I've been talking about uh, lineage just a little bit, um, but that's sort of the, the uh, key of, of how this worked. Um, so here is actually used lineage. By only three or four people. Okay. Um, so, uh, so lineage is a tool to, uh, that enabled us to make multi-sites uh, inside of Plone. So uh, it's, a, it's an add-on you can install, and once you've installed it, um, you can walk up to basically any folder in the system and say, I want this to be a separate site. And once you do that, um, then it, it sort of appears as though you're in a separate Plone site um, instead of the main site. Um, so you can make as many of these nested uh, inside of each other as you want. Um, and each time you go into one, you sort of take it into a, a, new, a new land, a new, a new site. And so um, this is probably the most technical part of the talk, uh, is, is how, how does that actually work? Um, so in, uh, in Plone, uh, around version 3.2 or 3.3, it's been so long, I don't, I don't remember. It was a 3.3 that actually landed it. Um, we uh, got a notion of an I navigation route. Um, so this is something you can use to um, know where uh, the site navigation uh, sort of routes itself. So that's, that's how you get that experience once you enable the uh, lineage add-on uh, or the lineage um, behavior uh, on that folder, uh, that's what makes everything sort of uh, work properly. Um, so there's, there's tools that know to look uh, to the navigation route to, to know what to show you in that uh, particular uh, place. Um, so we took the iNavigation route um, and also iPossible site and uh, made a new um, uh, interface, which is mostly just a marker interface, if I recall correctly, called an iChild site. Um, so that's how we know uh, a folder in the site is actually uh, a lineage-based site. Um, and that actually can be used for, uh, for other things. Um, there, there's an add-on to uh, index things based on, based on that, uh, based on what 
uh, parent site you're in. So um, for our cases, we just wanted to make sure we could mark that um, so we knew how to get back to it um, and, can, and could do things with it. But other add-ons for Lineage have actually used that uh, for other purposes. So we saw the old um, creation workflow. Uh, so now once we've, we've got all the content in the system, um, and we're just running the new version of, of the site. Um, let's see the, the glorious new version of, of how this works. So uh, we're no longer using the ZMI, uh, which is a plus. <laughs> Uh, so I think, I think you guys have seen this, this sort of interface before. Not, this, not the sexy Plone 5 uh, version yet, but uh, this still works. Um, so now here's our new uh, course creation button. Um, we just have a, a course type in our drop-down menu. So you just walk up to, uh, in this case, the econ uh, department. You can, you can already see there's an econ 101 inside of there. And you can just add a new course. So um, you know, course is just a dexterity type. Um, and we took the sort of metadata from, they used to be on the, the, the portal object uh, properties and added those to the course. So now we have the, the title, um, we have description, we have the course author and the course number. Um, we also have uh, what are called section IDs, uh, which is um, uh, at Penn State there's a system uh, called Angel. Um, and if you want to uh, link together a, um, a course with a group of people, uh, you need a section ID. So this used to be done, this also used to be done through the ZMI. Um, so once they copy pasted and they cleared and rebuilt the catalog and updated all the titles and everything and the course author and all that, they're actually going to the ACL users folder, go to the angel pass plugin, go to some uh, other properties tab and put this, this number in there and hit save. Um, and that just gave them the ability to add those users um, to the object. So in this case, We've actually enhanced the, the system as well. You can actually put a, a list of section IDs here. Uh, it will go add it to the Angel Pass plugin. It'll go get the uh, what they call rosters. So it'll pull down the, the list of faculty and the list of students, and it will set the um, the local uh, roles on the course based on that information. So the students will be automatically be given the reader role. So you know in this in this case. Everything is, um, is sort of private once it's created, so you have to be given access uh, so you can see it. So once you enter this, the faculty is given um, editor and uh, another permission, I forget. Uh, but basically, they're given sort of managerial control over the course, and the students are automatically granted access to the, to the system. Um, and then there's a few other properties to uh, do things like uh, add some banner images and some, just some customizations that can be used for each course. Uh, so this is a much simpler uh, process. So once we've created it, um, here's our course. And so this is actually right after the course has been saved. Um, so we can see there's uh, 16 lessons. There's an introduction text. Um, and so this, this page here is actually just uh, rich text. So the welcome to Econ 102 was dynamically put into the text um, before the page is created. Um, and then there was, uh, the 16 folders were created automatically um, and created with some default content. So before, this was just all part of the, the initial uh, template. But now we were actually dynamically creating this uh, content with, uh, with, actually with Plone API, uh, which was nice. Um, so it's just ready for the, the uh, faculty member or the teacher to come in and start customizing it to their needs. You know, they can delete and, and add everything they need. Um, so, so that's all just done automatically on save. Um, so that's just done through uh, uh, subscribers uh, once you create the, the piece of content. Same with the, um, the angel pass. So that's just all done through um, the event subscribers. So I mentioned a little bit about uh, permissions. So uh, we're using the Angel Pass product. And really, that's the only uh, sort of additional uh, thing we're adding in for, for permissions. So this could be an LDAP plugin. This could be whatever kind of plugin to, to get users into the system, users and groups. Um, but we're, otherwise, we're just utilizing the, the stock clone system. Um, so one thing that gives us here in this case, is a, a, a global list of users and groups. Um, so you only have to define that 
uh, editor group once. Um, you only have to add those people to there once, and then they're they're able to control all of the uh, all the courses in the system and all the departments without any any further uh, changes. So if you add a new course, they're already able to to go and, and do that. Whereas before, that's another manual step that would have to be done uh, before you're ready to go. Um, yeah, and so I mentioned the, the sharing tab for the faculty and students. That's just automatically done. Um, but they could still go in and use that to, to add more people to it. So, you know, this is um, sort of, th this is great for them, uh, but what are some of the disadvantages? So these are some of the things we talked about uh, before uh, potentially embarking on this. Um, one disadvantage may be that it could be harder to split out a course out of the system in the future. So if we had a course that was, was very popular and it was starting to bring down the system, it would be very hard to actually take that course out and move it into its own uh, plone site again. Uh, we'd probably have to write a, uh, another transmogrifier pipeline to actually automatically do that and then just bring that up in a new site. Um, and so now that we do have a global list of users and groups, this could crowd the, the users and groups uh, admin as well. So once you go there, there's going to be a, a larger number of, of users and groups there. Um, but you know, there's search and there's other things to mitigate that. So that's not a, that's not a huge problem. And anyone who's, who's hooked up Plone to a, a large Active Directory or uh, LDAP knows that you know, there could be a, a lot of users in there. Um, another issue that could come up is uh, it, it could be harder to theme different sections um, with a completely different theme. Uh, this is doable, but it, it makes it a little bit more complicated because we're all in one uh, install of Plone. So there's not a lot of uh, like sort of out of the box ways to do that really easily. It can be done, but it, it could be a bit harder. Um, and another, uh, this could be a disadvantage or an advantage, um, add-ons and properties are also global things. So um, the site uh, email, uh, the site from address, the, uh, the list of add-ons that are installed, those things are all global now. So if you add a new, new add-on, then that's available for all the departments um, so, and all the, all the courses. So if a course was really specific and, and very different, uh, this may, may, might not make sense for them. And so with disadvantages, there are uh, many advantages. Um, so you know, the, I think one of the best advantages here is hierarchical content. So when you actually browse uh, the list of content, it makes more sense. You, you walk up to a department, you see a list of courses, you go to a course, you're on the course. Um, so that, that just makes more sense to me. Um, and sort of tailing on the disadvantage of having the, the, a, a larger number of users and groups um, in the system, those are all, all available now in one place. So you don't have to keep adding them uh, in each, play, in each uh, course. So we have a, a centralized uh, repository of users and groups uh, that we don't have to change each time. So if we have global groups that we want to use, we can now use those uh, across the site. Um, and another one sort of tailing on a disadvantage is uh, add-on upgrades and install our global. So if you need to upgrade an add-on, you don't have to go upgrade that add-on 120 times. Um, and in, you know, once you install the add-on, it's available for all those sites. You don't have to go install it 120 20 times. So in this case, it makes a lot of sense because all the sites are very similar. Um, it doesn't really make sense to, um, to, to have a, a lot of special, t special tools uh, for a particular course. Um, so that's, I think that's an advantage in this case. Um, Another one is upgrading the actual uh, sites themselves. Um, so with the previous system, uh, doing a Plone upgrade would be doing a Plone upgrade against 120 sites. Uh, in this case, uh, you're just dealing with the upgrade of one Plone site um, that has all, the, all that content in it. Um, and another one that, uh, in this case, they didn't really need, but um, you know, depending on your needs, it might be something you would want. You could actually share content much easier uh, within within the courses because uh, here they're all on one site, so you have access them, access to them through the catalog or through direct access. Um, so you have all that content available to you. Um, and so the last advantage in this case was was a performance boost. Um, so in the case of 
uh, Penn State, um, they were getting slammed on Sundays, I believe it was. Everyone was, was cramming to get their work done before Monday. Um, so everyone was overloading all these different clone sites and um, it was really hurting performance. Um, and since we did this work, uh, they've, they've not had uh, any, any slowdowns or outages that I know of. So they, they've, they've been very happy with, with the new system. Um, so I would say that's actual success rather than the uh, sort of questionable success of before. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. Um, I have a couple links. Um, we just want to link to uh, Lineage, and this, these will go up on SlideShare or wherever, uh, the Penn State College of Liberal Arts and Transmogrifier, um, and then all these wonderful people that put their, uh, their photos on Flickr uh, with a Creative Commons license. I give you a thumbs up because they were beautiful pictures. Um, and that's it. So any questions? It's on the top, yeah. <laughs> Pesky wireless mic. Okay. So no. Do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a product called lineage.theme selection that someone created that mm -hmm. works pretty well with the child sites. Uh, you just go to the child site and you have a new theming tab up there and it lets you choose a Diazo theme to style that child site. Okay, and, I didn't know that worked. And it can be set it's separate for all child sites. Okay. So perfect. I've tested it, played around with it a little bit, haven't used it in production. Okay. So a, a report of, of uh, maybe one of those disadvantages of disappearing, disappearing so lineage theme selection. Um, and I didn't realize that did Diazo, so that's that's really nice. Um, cool. Kim? I can repeat, yeah, I can repeat. Um, products, no, because products are coming from uh, the root of the clone site. Um, there are some things you can do. So one other thing I mentioned was uh, properties. Uh, there's an add-on called lineage.registry, um, um, but that'll only work with the registry itself. Um, so if, you, like, if you're still running Plone 4.3, the email address, the title of the site, that's all set on the, the root properties tab, um, and there's still the property sheets so it doesn't do anything for that. Um, but once we get to Plone 5, that'll be a much better story uh, for, for properties. Um, so then, because it basically just intercepts the call to iRegistry. Um, because it is an i possible site, um, it knows that it can actually be um, sort of a proxy for the, the registry itself. And so you can actually uh, edit the registry for each individual site. Um, I haven't, that's another one I haven't used in production yet. Um, but for products, and things that are installed at the root, there's nothing you can really do. I mean, you could, um, you could do things based on the, uh, the, the child site, maybe the ID, or you could do something else to sort of mitigate that. Like if you didn't want the, the products, like the, the content types themselves to show up, you know, you could use restrict, and restrict the types, things like that. But as far as them being installed, there's not much you can do. And I didn't repeat the question, did I? <laughs> okay, so, so sorry, I, I, email from address, you could sort of use acquisition though, right? You could attach a property on a... Right, so the question is for, for something like the email address, the title, um, you could just use ac acquisition for that. I actually wrote another lineage add-on called uh, lineage.proxyprops. I believe it's a 0 0.2 alpha, um, and it warns you on the page, do not use this. But you could if you wanted to, and you were brave. Um, it actually intercepts calls to uh, the properties tool using the iProperties tool. So you have to be in at least 3.2 or something like that where that was defined. Um, and it also intercepts calls to base properties, I think. It does, it does some really heinous stuff on the back end to do this and allow you to, to override those settings. So it's possible, but not really recommended. Um, I'm, I'm sort of just kind of waiting for Plone 5 and everything to get switch over to the registry to make that a lot a lot easier to, to deal with.
Any other questions? You, you, men you mentioned one of the disadvantages is uh, the each course, if you wanted to break it out to a different, uh, have you looked at uh, this data.fs, there's some kind of symbolic link to another data.fs, that, that te technique, you know? Right, so um, so you could do that, but you still that DataFS still lives within the the parent's DataFS. Um, so you you can't really, I mean, you could split that part out. Well, not really. I mean, you could you could just copy the whole data, delete everything else except for that one item, and then you know point point everything to that. Um, but splitting out a, a piece of the data FS, like say if it's the catalog, um, you know the catalog is still within that plone site. It's not really separated um, from from that uh, Zope instance. And mount points are kind of difficult to wrangle sometimes too. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.